We come now in the Word of God to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, for our scripture reading. We're going to read verses 16 through 24, so if you'll take your Bible there at home and follow along, Galatians chapter 5, and um, you'll note as we particularly move into verse 19 and into verse 22 that Paul is setting forth two radically different lifestyles, uh, frankly, the lifestyle in verses 19 through 21 is most repulsive. The lifestyle in verse 22 and following is very attractive and beautiful. It is the lifestyle of the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So we are reminded that in this world there are two and only two groups of people. There are believers and unbelievers. There are people who are saved and people who are unsaved. To use Augustine's terminology, there is the city of God and there is the city of man. Paul urges you and me who have the indwelling Holy Spirit within us to learn how to walk in the Spirit, be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, strengthened by Him under His controlling influence. We do not do that perfectly, but to learn more and more how to do this. So we begin the reading in Galatians 5 and verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There, in beginning in verse 22 and into verse 23, you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Imagine one tree with a variety of fruits. Put in the singular, the fruit of the Spirit, there is a variety of things that the Holy Spirit produces. Now the question that we want to consider is basically this, can you and I have in our lives the fruit of the Spirit in these difficult times in which we are living? The title is Experiencing Joy in Difficult Times, but it's really a broader question than that. Can we really experience and manifest those varieties of things that Paul lists, nine things there in verses 22 and 23? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Can we indeed manifest those things at this time? But with a bit of a narrow focus upon the issue of joy, but also the issue of peace, 
The second thing he lists there in his list, joy. third thing he lists is peace. Can we have comfort? We are going to experience a range of emotions in these difficult times. No one is perfect. And there is not anything necessarily wrong with many of these emotions. It simply means to be human. We see this in David, the great man of God, the king of Israel, in the Psalms. And there is a biblical realism here. When you read the Psalms, it's not all joy. That's for sure. David is experiencing at times sadness, at other times thanksgiving. At times he experiences fear, at times depression, confusion, discouragement anguish, grief, at other times happiness and joy. We are going to experience a range of emotions at this time of worldwide suffering. Jesus had a range of emotions in his humanity. Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus. And when Stephen was martyred, We read in Acts 8.2, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. There's nothing wrong with great lamentation. Read the book of Lamentations, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the prophet Jeremiah, when Jerusalem was leveled to the ground. It really was not a time of joy. It was a time of great lamentation, and Jeremiah expresses his grief. So there will be a range of emotions, a range of feelings. But can we, in the midst of all of this range, have these moments and times of peace and joy? and comfort from God. You note there the outline. Point number one, that joy is not absolutely dependent on our circumstances. Circumstances certainly help to bring about joy. Isaiah 65, 18, God says, be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. God is going to create a new heaven and new earth and new we will be rejoicing in the circumstances. Circumstances do contribute to joy. But joy is not absolutely dependent on circumstances. That's the point. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of James, familiar text for all of us, the book of James chapter 1. Here is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, James. And he begins, as he's writing to believers, he's writing actually to Jews. James chapter 1, verse 1, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And note what he says to these Jewish believers. Verse 2, and this is an interesting word, hegeomai in the Greek, as the idea of weighing the facts, weighing the facts of the case when we fall into trials and difficulties. He says, think about this. Weigh the facts that trials produce moral beauty. And he says, my brethren, count it. Weigh the facts. Hey, get on my weigh the facts. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, difficulties. So what is God doing in these days? Scripture would indicate that God is doing a lot of things. One of the things that he is doing, surely, is testing the faith of his people. God does that. He did that with Abraham. James picks up on this 
He says in verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith, he tests our faith, basically to show us what kind of faith we have. He already knows. But he tests our faith. And note the end product of the process of God testing our faith. You and I come into greater spiritual maturity as a result. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God allows these things to happen, to test us. And you and I will be different. We will be, the believer will be more mature on the other side of the test. And so you can have a certain view about difficult times knowing that it's going to change us. We come now to point 1B, the example provided by Paul, and we're going to spend most of our rest of our time in the book of Philippians. So if you turn over a few pages to the book of Philippians, Paul is in prison when he writes this letter to the church in Philippi. Paul is in Rome under house arrest described in Acts 28. You note how he describes his circumstances. We're in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. He's riding from Italy to the area, pretty much the Balkan Peninsula, where Philippi is on the Aegean Sea. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, you notice things happen. Things happen to us. We did not plan on this trial that we are in, that things happen. Who could have guessed this? Things happen. We didn't know this when we began the year in January. No human being knew, really knew this. Things happen. The things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Surprising thing. Here you have a preacher who is incarcerated, he can't get out, he can't really preach. He is teaching, though, under house arrest, but who would have thought that all of this would result in the furtherance of the gospel? And maybe this is happening now. The gospel is being furthered, even though churches are not meeting. And yet it could well be that the gospel is spreading even more. He says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So Paul is chained. He is imprisoned. He's in Rome. He can't get out. He can't leave the house. He's under house arrest. And we too have movements, our movements are restricted in what we can do at this time. You know how Paul is reacting to all of this. We see this in verse 18. At the end of the verse, he says, in this I rejoice. In this I rejoice. Our joy is not totally dependent on our circumstances. Our peace is not totally dependent on our circumstances. So we move to point number two. We must remember that the possession of joy does not exclude real sorrow. Paul had real sorrow, Romans 9, 2. He said, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. He had sorrow, he had grief, because his people, the Jews, were not saved by and large. They had rejected the Messiah as a nation. So even as he says here in Philippians 1, verse 18, I am rejoicing that did not nullify the fact that at the same time in his soul, 
he had sorrow. You can have a couple of emotions at the same time. You can have a range of emotions. We are complex. We are not simple. He had sorrow. He says his grief was continual, and yet here he's rejoicing. Jesus was the same way. Jesus is called the man of sorrows in Isaiah 53, 3. And yet in John 15, 11, he speaks about his joy. He had sorrow because he had to live among us, sinful people. There was sorrow, there was suffering, but he had joy as well. Keep in mind, too, that saved people mourn because of sin. Yes, we have joy, but we also mourn. We do mourn. Jesus referred to this, Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn. His disciples mourn, and yet we're blessed Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning and being comforted. So we come to our third point, some special counsel laid out in Scripture. If we're going to have to, uh, any joy and peace and comfort and long-suffering, if we're going to have any of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. We have to be thinking, we have to be meditating on truth. We have to be thinking about the past, the present, and the future on biblical truth. And so Paul shows us how to do this, how you and I should think. If you turn over to Philippians 3, notice he says in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He does not say rejoice in your circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord as you are united to Christ. That is the subtle truth of the believer. We are in union with Christ. We are in Christ. We are in the Lord. We turn back a few pages to the book of Ephesians, Paul writes about this, the fact that we are the body of Christ, so united to him that we actually constitute his body. You'll note here, we're in Ephesians 5, verse 29, he says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, that is, his own body, unless a person is psychologically disturbed, under normal circumstances, we don't hate our own bodies. But what do we do? We protect our bodies. In fact, we have a moral mandate. We saw that earlier today. We have a moral mandate to be very careful with our health and our physical bodies. That is a moral duty. Not to do so would be sin. He says no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Yes, a person who is psychologically sound will nourish and cherish his own body. God made us that way. But note what he says. He says, just as the Lord does the church. What do you mean, Paul? Here's the answer in verse 30. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are the body of Christ. Jesus loves us. Why? We're members of his body. You say, I don't understand that. Well, no one fully does, but it is true. He says in verse 32, this is a great mystery. You're not going to fully understand that. You have to accept it by faith. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So we are to rejoice in the Lord. We are united to him.
Point three, sub point B, Paul shows us that we are to recall our dear friends in this life, the friends that God has brought to us in the course of our lives. We look at this in Philippians chapter one, and notice with me what he says is he's writing to the church in Philippi. He's in Rome, writing to Philippi. He says in Philippians one, verse three, Remember, he's imprisoned. And you notice here what's going on in his emotional life. He can be thankful. And he can even have joy. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. One of the things he did while he was there is he thought about his dear brethren in the city of Philippi, the church which he had planted, the people that he loved and worked with. He says, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. So you and I can think of people who have blessed us through the years, through the decades. And when we think of them, we have joy. He has joy. He says, verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Jesus actually promises joy to us on the basis of the friends that we have when we become a follower of Jesus Christ. We see this in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. The demand of Jesus is that we must follow him. And Peter reflects on that in Mark, chapter 10, verse 28. We read, then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. They actually literally left everything. And Jesus makes this remarkable statement. Verse 29, so Jesus answered and said, Surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Now notice this. On the one hand, there's leaving, but on the other hand, there's receiving. And it's receiving now in this life and in the life to come. He says in verse 30, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. It's not, we're not in heaven yet. He's a realist. And in the age to come, eternal life. You notice what he says. You're going to receive, you follow me, you're going to receive. Yes, you all had a mother, a father, but you're going to receive fathers and mothers. You have a brother and sister, yes, but you're going to receive brothers and sisters in the church of Jesus Christ and even children. Fascinating statement. It's worth it to follow Jesus Christ in terms of the blessings even that you get in this world, but even more in the age to come, you will, he says, receive eternal life. In the age to come, eternal life. We should also, coming back to Philippians, point three C, remind ourselves that God is working even now. If you look at Philippians 1, Paul's aware of this. Paul's in prison. He can't get out. He's locked down. Yet things are happening in the first century. And likewise, today, things are happening. The gospel is going out. You can't change the gospel. We need to remind ourselves that God is working. Okay, so we're not meeting in public on the Lord's Day, which, generally speaking, is what the Lord wants. But we have a moral obligation to protect our life and the life of our brethren, and therefore we meet in a different way in a virtual worship service. This is God's moral principle 
Do not be reckless. We must do this. And that the gospel is not chained. God is working. Notice Philippians 1 verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. It doesn't even matter what the motives of some men are. They could be bad motives, ill motives. But still, the same thing is happening. Christ is being preached. And notice Paul makes a decision. He says, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. He's basically like James. James says, determine. Determine what your response is going to be as you think it through. Determine what your response is going to be. That's what Paul's doing. He says as he's there in prison, I will rejoice. Another thing that we should do as we come to 3D, think about what God has done in the past. You'll notice in your Bible, Philippians 1 and verse 6. This is a very comforting work in light of the Word of God, very comforting, in light of the devil and his accusations that um, you're not going to persevere, I'm going to take you down. No, he's not going to take his people down. It's not going to happen. Philippians 1 verse 6. Notice Paul's statement. See, this is why you can't lose your salvation. That's the problem with Arminian theology, the idea that you can lose your salvation. Big problem, false theology. This one text would overthrow the Arminian system at that point. Paul says, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun, now notice how he describes salvation, a good work in you. That's what God does in salvation. God begins a good work in the past for many of us. He began the good work. We may not exactly remember when he began the good work. Some of us may, some of us may not. He began the good work. Conviction of sin. Turning to the Lord. Calling upon Jesus Christ. Save me. Faith, repentance, that's the good work. God begins the good work. Now, can you lose your salvation if you're really saved? No. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. God will finish the job. Even if you have backslidden big time, and wandered away from him, God will bring you back. That's what the text says. We may have total confidence that if a person is really saved, although he or she has fallen deeply, God will bring them back. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the second coming. Second coming, our, our bodies are glorified. Salvation is finished. God is still saving his people. We come to subpoint E. Let us calm our anxieties with prayer. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Men of God, women of God, can have anxiety. None of us is perfect. Again, read the Psalms. David had anxiety, most definitely, at various times. What should we do? Know what the Lord says to us through Paul? Philippians 4, 
Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's the invitation for you and I to come to lay out our petitions before God. These are days when you and I should pray. Now, if we would do that, something amazing is going to happen. Note verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is supernatural. It's an actual peace. It's a feeling of calm and tranquility that comes upon us from God. It surpasses all understanding, but we have to pray. Now we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 as we wind our study down this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, subpoint F, remember that our suffering will not last forever. These days will not last forever. Paul suffered big time. Many passages in the New Testament show us this, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, remind us of his suffering. He says, we are hard pressed on every side. We are perplexed, persecuted, struck down. He suffered more than you and I probably ever will. And yet he says, as he thinks about this, Dropping down to verse 16, he says, We do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. It's one of the things that God does. We all know that we are weakening physically over the years. But in the soul, it's being recreated, refashioned into the image of Jesus Christ. The inward man, he says, is being renewed day by day as we engage in truth, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit renews us. Now note this statement in verse 17 as he thinks about the present and the future. He sets up a contrast between the affliction of the present and the glory in the future. As he thinks about the glory in the future, he calls it a weight. As he thinks about the affliction of the present, he calls it light. And this glory which is to come is eternal. But the affliction is just for the moment. We need to remember that. Verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. So, if this situation in the United States lasted for months, we don't know, but if it did, some are saying it will. And what if there is a second wave, as some are saying could happen? We need to remember it is for a moment in comparison to eternity. It's for a moment. And then finally, we need to focus our hope on heaven and eternity. That's what Paul is doing here in this passage as we move down to verse 18. He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, that was not the real focus of his life, the present structures of reality, things that we can see. What do we look at? He says, but at the things which are not seen. Now, why would he do that? 
He says, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This is very similar to Hebrews chapter 11. The writer says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in tents in a foreign country. He says they were waiting for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It says they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. He says they desired a better that is a heavenly country. Paul in Philippians 3.20 talks about our citizenship, our true commonwealth. Politima is the word he uses, our true commonwealth is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So may we, as the scripture would say, put all of your trust, put all of our trust in him who is willing to save all who will call upon him.